asthma and COPD. You all know me. I had done asthma, allergies, and COPD for many years. It's kind of part of my life, is asthma, COPD, and diabetes. I love um, meeting with patients and going over these, these topics. Um, we're going to start with asthma a little bit. Now, people that have asthma also have COPD, and people that have COPD also have asthma, okay? So they like sister diseases, and this is why we kind of cover them together. Oh, look at you and your cat. Is that feeling good? Well, I've better things in my life. <laughs> so, many of the inhalers that we use, and which, by the way, I brought them all here today, for us to play around with, because at one point or another point, you're going to be using some of these inhalers, so we're going to practice a little bit. Okay? Um, so, asthma and COPD are diseases that start, in the case of asthma, early in life. With COPD, a little later in life. Okay? What causes this problem many times is exposure. For COPD, is exposure to tobacco smoke. And for asthma, is the re-exposure to tobacco smoke many allergies in the home, and unfortunately, it runs in the family. Um, so what do we do? People that have asthma and COPD have a real hard time breathing, as you can tell us, Walter. Um, so a lot of patients say, and I guess the common misunderstanding years ago it was, well, I have asthma, I have COPD, I can't exercise, I can't run, I can't walk. Oh, please, could we have a letter for our son or daughter that says that she has asthma so she doesn't have to go to the gym uh, because she can't breathe. Well, now we know that the best thing you can do for people that have COPD and asthma is to exercise. Uh, why? Because that really helps to make the lungs stronger. That helps your airways to get better. So that's one thing that we definitely want to do. Exercise, okay? Ideally, we should be able to sleep through the night without any problems. Now, why do you think asthma and COPD gets worse in the evening? The air is heavy. The air is heavy. How many of you know, have you personally have had an asthma attack or a COPD attack at night, but not during the day? Usually it's night. Oh. You have a hard time at night. Yeah. Do it mm -hmm. the tree of right. So there's two things. If you have COPD or asthma, you make a hormone called cortisol. Cortisol is being made by your kidneys, okay? By the adrenal glands that sit over the kidneys. Cortisol drops as the day goes by. And it drops, and what happens is when it drops, you don't have enough of the good, make me feel good hormone flying around. Cortisol is the same thing as prednisone. And many of you have it on prednisone. So cortisol goes down as the evening. Why? Because the circadian rhythm goes like this. Your body gets ready to go to bed, cortisol goes down, your body says, I don't think I need you anymore, and I'm going to go to sleep. So the cortisol drops, and COPD and asthma attacks happen at night. What happens in the morning? Heart attacks happen in the morning. So having worked in the emergency room, I see what? People being rolled in with asthma attacks in the middle of the night, and then we have people shipping in in the morning with, with heart attacks. Why heart attacks in the morning? Because you wake up and your heart is searching, searching for the right medium, searching to get into a rhythm, and that search causes the heart to get a heart attack, for you to get into a heart attack, if you are propensed to that. So that's how we have asthma at night, and heart attacks in the morning. So this is why asthma and COPD are really important diseases that people should be able to sleep through the night. I remember growing up with an asthmatic brother, and my mother didn't know what else to do for him. Every night, <coughs> So back in Peru, of course, eucalyptus, fans, hot towels over his head and face, <laughs> suffocating the kid. You know what? To do. Why? Because his cortisol was going and his inflammation was high, so he would wheeze through the whole night. So ideally, we want to, want to make sure patients have nebulizer for them at home, we have oxygen ready to go, and we have all the rescue medications ready to go because that's what the time that's going to happen. Asthma and COPD, people go from flare-up to flare-up to flare-up. So you ask anyone, do you have COPD? No. Do you have asthma? No. 
So what they mean, I'm not having an asthma attack right now. I'm not having a COPD flare right now, so I don't have it, right? Like the guy that you ask, do you have high blood pressure now? Yes, you do. That's why you're taking the 20 pills you're taking. <laughs> well, it's not high now, right? It's not high because you're taking all those pills, right? <coughs> now, for people that have asthma and COPD, it's a good idea to check the lungs with a peak flow meter or with a spirometer. That's why you, when you come to the office, we have you blow into the machine, we have you do the, the peak flow meter. And again, ideally, we want to decrease the side effects. So what is asthma? Asthma is a chronic disease that happens and patients will have coughing, wheezing, chest tightness, and shortness of breath. And it's exactly what happens with COPD. Uh, we know that COPD has inflammation and asthma also have inflammation. That's why they're sister diseases. They both come together. There's inflammation. So it's not only the fact that the muscle around the tubes are tight, but the pipe that's inside is loaded with inflammation. So we need, somehow need to clean that path for the patient to breathe. And this is when you have a COPD or asthma attack, we push on prednisone, we give you the shots of prednisone to help you breathe better. Uh, patients that can't breathe usually is due because the amount of inflammation is very high. So the medications that we give you are going to help you to bring that down for the C oh, patients with COPD and the patients with asthma. Okay. So this is just kind of a very busy slide, but it kind of gives you an idea. This is good for, for Morgan's to see who's doing nursing school. So you can see how the muscle around, this is the bronchial, and they have cut that in half. And this is, let's say, Walther's bronchios. And uh, so this is muscle, and the muscle is really tight. And inside, you have a lot of mucus and a lot of edema. So mucus is just the thickness that happens, and you uh, can't get it out, right? And the edema is just the swelling amount, the swelling that happens in, around the, um, the pipe, okay? So the medications we're giving you are going to help to decrease that inflammation inside, okay? So I'm going to flip to that. Again, people that have asthma or COPD are very, very sensitive, very, very sensitive to things in the environment, okay? So unfortunately, there'll be very th simple things such as a cold, something simple as a perfume, something as simple as you inhale somebody's secondhand smoke, that's going to cause a whole trigger of response on you. Uh, unfortunately, it's a patholo pathologic damage, meaning this damage is permanent, and we can't reverse it many times, especially on the COPD patient. Okay? So you can see here how you have a lot of inflammation in the airways, and what we thought years ago, years ago, we thought that the, the patient had tightness in the lungs. Let's open them and we're done with it. But now, 1900s, 2000s, we're learning that, oh, no, guys, we were wrong. The asthmatic and the COPD has more than that. You know that years ago, if you had asthma, you were giving only a little puffer, and they will open up your lungs. And if you have COPD, too, that, and they will send you home. And people were dying of these because we didn't know that when you had asthma and COPD, you actually had inflammation inside. So people were going home with just one little puffer. Like, how many puffers do you have now, Walter? Or, right. Why? Because they all work different, right? <coughs> they all work different. What about you, Ramon? Three. Three, right? Years ago, no. All we had is this guy, this blue one. We just had a key. That, that was it. You had COPD or asthma. And then the other thing we had, I don't know if you remember, years ago, Walter, it's called theophylline. was a drug. Theophylline is a drug that what it does is causes bronchodilation, okay, meaning opening the airways. And people were taking theophylline, but it's almost like uh, like drinking cocaine. We're making them like this. And then we have to check the levels. Well, I can breathe better. Yeah, but you, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that was all we had. And then all these wonderful uh, drugs came on board. And we know that um, there was something more. So there's a lot, a lot going on be beneath the surface. You have the symptoms, and you actually see there's a lot of stuff going on underneath the patient's lungs. And this is why they feel so sick. You have the inflammation going on. You have the airway that is really, really susceptible to a lot. Okay? So we know that there's many ways we call it asthma or COPD. Um, there's many patients that I think are misdiagnosed. Um, you're probably going to hear, you probably have heard in the past. So what did, they tell you, what did they tell you you had? Oh, they told me I had a touch of pneumonia. Touch of pneumonia. It's like being a little pregnant. Yeah. Not fully pregnant, just a little pregnant. So, 
you know, and a lot of patients that I see will say to me, oh, yeah, 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 they think they had a little asthma, like a little asthma, or it might be a little COPD, like a little one, not a big one. Well, it's either COPD or it's either asthma. You don't have a little bit of anything, right? So some patients are told, oh, you have allergic bronchitis. You have wheezy bronchitis. Well, I had this lady I saw the other day. She says, no, my doctor told me that I'm, I'm wheezy every March. What is like a Christmas tree with lights on it every Christmas or, you know, uh, also they call it asthmatic bronchitis, okay? Now, there's some patients that have asthma and COPD and never wheeze, okay? And that's a scary, especially children that come in and they're like, can't breathe, but you don't hear anything wheezing, nothing happening in their lungs. So, something to remember is that wheezing does not always mean asthma, and asthma may be present without wheezing. Okay, all COPD. Okay, so how do we know we have some symptoms of asthma or COPD? Shortness of breath, wheezing, tightness in the chest, coughing at night. And why at night, Ramona? I'm not sure. It's mostly when you lay down. Yeah, but why do we why do we have more cough and more COPD at night? What I happens to us? The air is heavy. Right, but what happens with us? We just talked about our. Oh yeah, the, the level goes down. What? The cortisol goes down. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Um, so, walking, waking up at night with symptoms is a key marker of uncontrolled asthma and, and COPD. So, if a patient or a relative says to you, hey, Becky, for the past month, I've been getting up every single night and I just can't breathe, you know he's in trouble. Well, how do you get the level up at night? How do we get the level with the medications? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So most, when they did a review of how many patients have died from asthma and COPD, were the patients that were waking up in the middle of the night with asthma and COPD. And it's sad because they actually have a, a mortality rate and they kind of, every time somebody dies, they keep track of that. And so when they, this, they, this, this guy that studied asthma and COPD and how many people actually die from that, they said that 90% of those patients that die from asthma and COPD where people that were getting up in the middle of the night that they couldn't breathe. So that's a very bad sign, okay? So again, we know when asthma or COPD happens, the lightning of the airways becomes very inflamed, the airway produces thick mucus, and the muscles around get really, really tight. Now, um, making, these, um, making these sentences very clear in the sense we have two things going on. One is the tubes around are tight and the inside is dirty. So we need two different things to, to open that, right? We need something to loosen that up, like a key that can open, and we need something that can go inside to clean those lungs. So we need two different medications, at least for COPD and asthma. Now, what makes asthma and COPD worse? Allergens, okay? And this is for both asthma and COPD. Warm-blooded pets. So we had a lady when I worked at Brigham, she had a cat, and we told her that, you know, we tested her, she was positive to cat allergy, and when she was older, older lady, and we told her that she knew, literally needed to get rid of her cat, because every time she came in, she was having this horrible tax because of the cat dander, or because of the cat. And we told her, you know, you need to get rid of the cat, and so we explained to her, is that, you know, the, the cat is giving you these, all that. So she comes back a month later, and we asked her, you know, how she was doing. She says, great. I think I'm still wheezy, but not as bad. I said, whoa, so did you give the cat to somebody? Oh, no, no, I shaved my cat. Oh, yeah, good. <laughs> so she has shaved the cat, thinking that by shaving the cat, she was saving herself from having an attack. But what happened is, if you understand what the process is, it's not so much the hair on the cat, because you can literally take the hair out of with the, with back tape out of the cat, is that if you're warm-blooded, you shed those little scalps, and the little scalps, the protein, the protein goes in your nose, and that's what starts the whole chain of reaction, okay? So, same thing, any, any, uh, any warm-blooded pet will cause that, like dogs, cats. We know that patients that sit in couches where the dog has been laying it in will have a problem because it's the dander of the dog. We know that roaches, uh, pulling from the grass and trees, mold will cause a problem. A lot of older apartments that have a lot of mold in their rooms is really important for patients to clean that mold. And if you don't know how much mold you have, you can definitely get a gadget at Home Depot that will check the humidity in your room. And if any, there's anything more than 40 degree um, for, for um, humidity, it's too humid. And you actually brew spores there, okay? 
Now, I say that because we all think in the winter we have to put a lot of humidity. We need to put a lot of humidity in the room because we can't breathe, right? So what patients do is they go and they get all these humidifiers and they're pumping them up. Bathroom, bedroom, and the thing looks like uh, some jacuzzi going on and a hot tub going on. Like you walk into these patients' rooms and they're like houses. I used to do home visits. And the house is like blurry. You can't even see through because the soil, the moist, oh, it's dry, we need to put the moist. So, but then again, they're brewing all this mold, okay? And mold is bad for your lungs, so you gotta be careful with that, okay? Irritants like cigarette smoke, wood smoke, scented perfumes, any strong odor will cause an asthmatic and a COPD to have problems. Pesticides, we had a lot of these issues when I worked in Worcester, they were putting, um, there was a lot of roaches in the apartments when the little, um, apartments that these low-income people, patients lived in, and they used to put pesticides in the houses, and then the kids would get back in the house, and they have this asthma attacks. It's like, really? You kill, kill the roaches and the kids at the same time. So the other thing is infections, and this is most important with COPD years. So the rule of thumb with patients with COPD is that if you have an infection, you have to cough, or you have to have something on hand. It's like the diabetic, that sugar goes down, you need to know what to do. So what do we do? What happens is you have a cold, you have an upper respiratory infection, you have to know exactly what to do at that point. So what do you do? You do an antibiotic right away, or you do prednisone right away. So you have to, I think you, I have your on the schedule on that, I think you too. I mean, if you see any pulmonologist at Dartmouth, that is rule of thumb. I haven't worked in pulmonary for a long time myself, I didn't let any patient go home without that on hand. Always, always, because you don't know when you're going to need it, okay? The little call that you got or that your neighbor got that seemed like a little tiny call to the neighbor is a big call for you, and now is you can't breathe because of the call that you have today. So thinking ahead and having a prescription, remember that prescriptions do expire. So if you were given an antibiotic and prednisone, make sure you check the expiration date on it. And make sure, of course, you're not allergic to that antibiotic before you take it home, okay? Just triple checking that, all right? And if you're gonna travel, make sure you take it with you because chances are you're gonna pick something in the plane, some cooties, and you're gonna get home and you're gonna get an infection. So make sure you have that prescription <coughs> and take that. <coughs> now, believe it or not, people can have asthma attacks and COPD attacks just from laughing too much or from being upset too much. I had a patient whose husband passed away. She's never had an asthma attack. Just pass, him passing away caused her to have a severe asthma attack because she cried so much. And she didn't know what happened to her, and that's what happened to her. Changes in temperature. We think that this, this weather is crazy. Well, it is very crazy. You go from below zero to normal temperature. So this is really, really bad. And especially if your airways are really sensitive, you have to be careful just because you don't know when you need to use these. Again, when we have a patient with asthma and COPD, you start on the nose and you all you go all the way into the lungs. And many times we deal with the triad that we call it is the nose, is the lungs, and is the skin. It counts as a trio. Have you ever, anybody seen patients like that or people like that? They have a stuffy nose, they have asthma, but they also have a skin that's really, really bad, like eczema. And it's the same disease. It's the same disease and we treat it the same. Okay? Um, unfortunately, it's hereditary. That runs in families, unlike COPD. Okay? Again, I put in here just things, again, that will cause problems, and this is summarizing what we just talked about. Roaches, latex. Some people are allergic to latex, very bad. Okay? And this is why we don't use latex gloves anymore in hospitals. Um, we also know that heartburn. How many of you knew that heartburn will make your asthma and COPD worse? You knew that? But no, I, I, I how, how would that be? I didn't understand the word. Harburn. 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 Yeah, Gerd. Gerd. <laughs> so what happens is that you make acid in your stomach called chloritic acid. That acid, which is a wonderful acid, kills the bacteria of the food that you eat. So that way you don't have diarrhea and you don't have infections. Or well, let's say if you eat the meat really, really raw, like my sound likes, you know, the beef is talking to him as he's eating them. Um, if he doesn't make enough chloritic acid, that meat is going to make him sick. So that acid is a good acid to have when you need it. The problem is when we make too much of it. We make too much of it, 
and therefore now you have you start having reflux. Now, when you lay down, that reflux, the harbor goes up north, it goes up north, and goes right into your airways and sit in your airways. And anytime acid gets into your airways, it's gonna cause something bronchospasmal, meaning tightness in your chest, tightness in your airways. <coughs> okay? And this is why people that have the reflux have trouble breathing. Okay? That's why we're trying to fix that reflux so you have less problems with your breathing. Okay? So fixing the, the heartburn is not only good for your stomach or for how you feel, but also it's gonna help your breathing. Okay? Um, we used to be very big on doing surgeries. We used to do all kinds of stuff, putting like staples here, staples there, helping people with a heartburn. We don't longer do that. But what we do do is put patients on a good regimen. We have them put bricks in the back of their in the back of the of the mattress and their bed to try to keep the head elevated a little bit. We also tell them not to eat too late at night, not to have a Mexican fiesta at night, and uh, and trying to really avoid too much. Um, um, too many foods that will cause an increase of heartburn. So we're going to go through these. Um, this is diagnosing asthma. I'm going to skip through that. So how do I know that your asthma or COPD is under really good control? Because you don't cough. You don't have problems breathing. You can wait. You don't wake up at night. You can do your activities without any problem. You're not having any episodes of asthma or COPD. You don't miss work. How many people that you know that have asthma or COPD miss work? A lot of people because they can't breathe, right? And what happens when you miss so many days of work, you will get fired and you won't have a job. Um, so the other things too is normal breathing due to nasal obstruction with subsequent loss of normal air conditioning by the nose. So the patients that can't breathe will use their mouth again a lot because they can't breathe through the nose, okay? Um, again, waking up at night is a bad sign for anybody. Uh, we know that if you go to an urgent care visit often for asthma attacks, is, it, I mean you should, but it's a bad sign. Another bad sign is this, that you're using your bronchodilator a lot, you, you're rescuing Heller. What would that be? This is the rescue. How many of you know the rescue Heller? What rescue. would be a bad, yeah, what would be a bad sign if you have COPD or asthma and you're using that a lot? Well, I'm shortness of breath, I can't breathe. Yeah, because you can't breathe a lot. So when the patient said, oh no, I'm using the blue Cold one that you gave me. Nice. Oh, I'm using the blue inhaler you gave me like every hour. Oh yeah, but it's not helping me anymore. Well, they used to make Primatine. I don't know how many of you remember Primatine. There was a model that used the dye using Primatine. Primatine was a like epinephrine, but in a puffer and it was over the counter. So this model had bad, bad asthma, and then, no, she, I guess, never told anybody she had bad asthma. She will go, so she will buy her inhaler in between shots or whatever, she will go in the back and use the primatine, and they found her in the dressing room dead with the primatine on her hand. So it was a good thing they did because they pulled primatine off the market, and it's no longer over the counter, because I have patients that used to buy primatine over the counter and use it to breathe better. But it's very deceiving because you use it they open your lungs, you can breathe better, but what happens? We talked about something else besides the tightness. What was inside the tubes? A lot of? Yeah. Junk. Junk. Yeah. And that junk yeah. is now gone. Right? So when you have asthma or COPD, your lungs are just like a little house. The door of your house is closed. And the house inside is really dirty. You need two things. You need a key to open the door so you can get in, and you need a broom to clean the house so the house will be nice and clean. When you have a fire of the house, when your house is burning, how many have a fire in your house? Does anybody? We have. Yeah. So what do you do? Do you go and say, hey, grab me the broom, let me clean the house? No. Or you say, grab me the stupid keys, I'm gonna open this house so I can get out, right? Same thing, when you're having an asthma attack or a COPD attack, what do you do? You grab your key so you can breathe better, right? Now, but every day, the everyday deal is you keep the house clean with what? With your brooms. So many of you have this inhaler called Simbicor, all right? And this is to use twice a day. Now, am I going to use this when I'm having a fire on my lungs? No. 
No, no. why? What is this? This is my broom. That's my broom. This is the one that's going to keep my lungs clean. It's not the one that's going to open my lungs. Probably Tudosa. Well, Tudosa is also a broom. Oh, that's a broom? Yep. It's like a broom. Right? So remember, keys are to open doors and rooms are to clean. So you remember you need to use something that will help you to clean when you're ready to clean it. But when you have an emergency, you can't be using your broom. You have to use your keys unless you're a witch you want to fly. Right? So again, knowing that you're using your key too many times or your bronchodilator or your rescue inhaler too many times is bad news. Why? Because we know you're not, you're not doing okay. Okay? So again, many times the reason why I brought this in here is because asthma and COPD really relies on how, many how you use your inhaler. And I have a huge issue with patients going home not knowing how to use their inhalers. Um, I had a guy that had been referred to a pulmonologist. He's seen all these professionals. And he wasn't getting better. He wasn't getting better, and he wasn't getting better. So they put him on my schedule. First time I'm seeing this man, he's on all kinds of inhalers. I mean, he brings me a bag of his medications. And I said, okay. I said, okay, Tim, so why don't you show me how you use your inhaler? So he grabs the thing, puts it in his mouth, and takes, he says, four, one, two, three, four. He never took the cap off the inhaler. Oh, no. <laughs> and I said, how long have you been doing that like that? He says, oh, since they told me I had to use them. And I go through them really quickly. And no one told you you have to open it and put your mouth in there and suck it up? No. But that's meant for you. <laughs> oh. You know, no one told the guy how to do anything. So he's seen a pulmonologist. What a, what a disgrace. What a loss of services. What a, what, you know, I mean, that's why our healthcare is going south. Because no one took the time and I said, Tim, all you needed is for somebody just to tell you, open the thing, prime the thing, stick it in your mouth, and suck. I mean, that's all you have to do. She's like, oh, really? So, needless to say, I took him off a lot of the medicine, put him on the right medication he needed to be on, and taught him how to do it. Doesn't take a long time, it's just a matter of teaching you how to do it. So, Morgan's going to show you all of these inhalers, how they work, right, Morgan? And um, to make sure all of you know, <coughs> at one point, some point, of, you will be in some of these inhalers. I have a question. Yeah. I have two rooms. <laughs> what do I use for a key? <laughs> The key is the Ventolin. Oh, are you supposed to do the Ventolin? No, you use the Ventolin only when you can't breathe. Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, I need <coughs> to The rooms, yeah, okay. to keep your lungs nice okay. and clean. Okay, Yeah, and Morgan's <laughs> going to come and teach you how to use these inhalers in just a second. Okay? All right, so I'm going to... Okay, this kid is doing what is called the allergic salute, and that's a salute that kids with allergy will do because they're very allergic. And you see the Shriners here, which is kind of what I was telling you about eczema and asthma. They all come together. And that's the kid with allergies in there. Okay? Again, going over some of the triggers, we talk about GERD, which is the heartburn. And then we have the sinus infection. We have the cigarette smoke and the food allergies that can cause problems. The indoors, again, this is just recapping again what we went over. Roaches. How do you know if you have roaches in your house or not? Dark and you turn on the light. <laughs> Are they staring at you? Flip back the sheet. <laughs> there you got You will know because if you have an air purifier or if you have an air conditioner, you take the filter off and you will see the droppings in the. In the um, oh, shoot. Last time I cleaned mine, there was none. <laughs> yeah. These are the dust mites. Now, the reason why I put them here is because every time I do a presentation, people don't know what dust mites are. Uh, so, dust mites, the problem with the dust mites are no, uh, these are what I also call them the bed bugs. Okay, the problem with the dust mites is not so much that um, they're ugly, but they actually people are allergic to them. Okay, so people that are in hotels, uh, make sure you check your mattress at home, make sure you use a mattress cover. Uh, they're tiny insects that eat the dead skin and the lip of your skin, and that's how they multiply. So you should be washing your sheets weekly, okay, and you should have some sort of mattress covers. You can see the mattress covers. Children love teddy bears. Make sure those teddy bears get washed. If you have a special pillow you sleep with, make sure you wash it often. Okay. Uh, roaches, they, um, unfortunately, the droppings of the roaches will cause us a problem. Okay. Um, 
mold, very and I talked about the mold earlier, and you can see all the mold in between the cracks, and there's the spores of the mold that will cause the patient the problem. Now, mold, if you, how many of you have nebulizers? I know you two have. So make sure the tubing that you have, you throw it away after a month that you have used it. If you have used it, if it's brand new, it's fine, but if you use it, make sure you throw it away. In between, what you do is you put a little bit of vinegar, half a cup of vinegar, a cup of water, mix it up, put the tubing in there, and clean it in that water. And that's going to help to clean the tubing out. Now, vinegar is one of the best things for mold. It's sad to see a patient that has insurance, that lives well with a bad tubing loaded with mold. I had a lady that was getting sick and sick, and I said, you know what? Bring me your nebulizer and everything in it. And she brought the nebulizer and the tubing, and the tubing was green. Oh, please. Oh, and she was using that tubing to give herself nebulizations at night because she couldn't breathe at night. And she said, I feel worse after I use it. So of course. It's like taking dirty toilet paper and trying to clean yourself with dirty. You know, it's like you don't, you don't do that. And she says, well, no one has ever told me. I'm thinking, who the heck was taking care of these people? No one has ever told me that I needed to take throw the tubing away. And some, some old, especially older patients like to save everything. I save the napkin, I save the ticket, I save my bag, you know, yeah, just, do. just in case. You know, and you got to tell them, you got to throw it away. <coughs> you don't, don't save that, you know. Uh, again, empty the fridge, uh, the AC drip, <coughs> wipe down the shower and the top toys, so avoid standing in the water and plug the paws. Clean, clean up spills. Um, Pedander, we talked about not shaving the cat, but actually um, you can spray your cat and your dog with dander. Proven um, is a spray you can put on that helps them to um, decrease the amount of dander. Dogs should take baths, and that will help. Okay. Tobacco smoke, and I know we talked about tobacco smoke, especially for the patient that smokes. Remembering that you're aging yourself quickly by smoking, and you remember also that. Um, there's many irreversible changes that take the cigarette does to your lungs. And it's a real sad thing because it's such a preventable thing, okay? Um, so no smoking in the presence of children at a home. I know that Vermont has passed a law that you can't smoke in the car with a child anymore, uh, which is good because if you want to have a, a habit, we shouldn't have to live because if you have a bad habit of giving the child a problem. Um, so there may be lack of affordable smoking-free child care, um, and it's now actually considered a child abuse if you smoke in the car with a child. Mm. Yeah. See, that's okay. why I yelled at you when you were out in the garage with the kids. <laughs> okay. So um, what we're going to do, um, now we're going to do the practical piece of these. And number one, we're all going to teach, teach you how to cough and how to breathe. Okay? So the first Thing we're going to do is teach you how to cough. You're going to pretend that you have a nice flat belly and you want to put your hand in front, of, in front of your flat belly. Okay, we all have a nice flat belly. Actually, why don't you take a book and put it in front of your flat belly? There <coughs> you go, because you're going to feel it better when you have a book. Okay? I'm going to teach you what is called a diaphragmatic breathing. Okay? What I mean by the diaphragmatic breathing is, Walther, I can't breathe, my nose is stuffy. I'm breathing through my mouth because I don't have any air. So I'm going to teach you how to use the diaphragm. Diaphragm is a muscle that runs through your chest, okay? And I'm going to teach you how to do that. And you know you're doing that because you're going to... So inflate, and you bring the air out of your mouth. When you have COPD or asthma, you need to learn how to conserve air. So you breathe in, you fill in your stomach with your diaphragm, and as you take the air out, it has to be in purse, we call it the purse leap breathing, meaning. Okay, so again, push forward. And it's different than what you're used to because when you're having an asthma attack or COP COPD attack, what do you do? I can't breathe. Not intentionally. Huh? Not intentionally. No, I know, but that's how you are. So instead of doing that, you do. And now you're using a different muscle, different part of your body, and it's giving you more oxygen so you don't feel like you're so short breath and you're going to, you're going to collapse. Because what happens if you keep doing that, 
you're going to go into a situation that's called respiratory alkalosis or respiratory acidosis. You actually can get really, really sick from it. Okay? So breathing. Okay? So everybody, in. I want to see the book going forward and out. In, book moving forward, out. In, out. And remember when you do out, whistling, good. In, okay. Now we're gonna do a nice cough, okay? In order to cough, we need to have hair that's gonna back up and come up north so we can get that green right out, okay? That cough right out. So we're gonna do. <coughs> okay. How many people do we have that I can't cough it out? I can't get the sputum out. Okay. So make sure you. We're gonna do fill our stomach up, bring their air in, and give it out. <coughs> get it out. There you go. One more time. Fill it. And cough it out as you exhale instead of exhaling it through and you go cough. <coughs> there you go. One more. You can do it. Like a cough, like you do it in the morning. <coughs> I can't. Make so it no, you don't have to make Walter, it by doing ah. these, you're giving yourself that extra push that you need to get that phlegm right out. Because that phlegm in the airways, all they're doing is blocking them. Okay? So, matter of fact, before you do that, have a nice cup of water that's going to help to liquefy the sputum or the phlegm. You can give yourself an nebulizer too that's going to help to liquefy the phlegm, especially if you're really junky in there. So you take a, and go to town. Okay, put something in front of you so it doesn't hit the wall. But, <laughs> but go, and go to town. There you go, again. Again, <coughs> and cough it out. Good. So now, Go. There you go. All right, so uh, I'm going to have Walther come here, right to the front. So, Walther. You're going to be able to do this with me, hold my eye. You are. That's the whole the idea of this, of this class. You can put it on the floor if you need to. So, and this is actually, guys, by the way, this is what respiratory therapists uh, teach you when you go through the classes. This is a course I took with them of teaching a patient with COPD how to live through. So, you got to go up about 10 flight of stairs. Okay, yeah. so you're extremely sure of breath, and you don't know if you're gonna make it out there. Okay, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna pretend that we got 10 stairs in front of us. We're gonna take a breath before we step, and we're gonna give it all. Okay, you can hold your breath, pick up your oxygen. You can actually, it's a backpack, put it right, put your backpack on. Okay, because you're trying to conserve energy. When you have COPD, you're conserving energy. You're trying to carry the air you go. Perfect. So we're gonna take a next breath in into your stomach. One. Another one. And, and breathe out. And another one. And out. Good. And give it another you know, one. I can't do much of that. And then I get so I can't breathe. I don't get enough oxygen doing that. You won't. You will though, as you practice it more. Keep doing. So get get it, breathe in. Get, get it. See, and that's it. So you went now four steps. You got four more to go, so you're gonna take a break. Okay, and again. Usually you, I take it on three steps. <laughs> yeah. The break. Well, no, 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 no. You Usually can't do that, Walter, because steps. what happens is if you do it in three steps, you're running yourself really ragged and you can actually collapse there. No, yeah. So take a step, take a breath, and let that go. And take another breath. So you're gonna go slow. And everything with COPD, remember, is about conserving energy. I'm planning. So you're going to go up eight floors or eight stairs, I should say. I wouldn't do it. No. <laughs> well, you have to because yeah, Debbie, oh, yeah. <laughs> Becky is up there and she is giving birth. No, she's doing. <laughs> what are you doing up there, Becky? Uh, no, she left there's, her rice. There's mashed potatoes and gravy at the top. <laughs> it's mashed potatoes and gravy on the top, but you've got to eat that because it's nice and warm and it gets cold. I'd make it, but okay. every third step, I sit no. there for five, ten minutes. Every, every step, every step. Okay? <laughs> So then, the other thing too, as you breathe in, you breathe it out. Okay? So walk in and breathe in. 
and breathe it out. There you go. And again, breathe in and breathe it out. Perfect. Good job, Walter. Perfect. See? 68. Oh, man, I, can, I still can learn. A 68, you can kick butt. <laughs> Very good. So it is a whole change of life, and this is why when you have COPD, they say to you, you need to go to a respiratory therapist, rehab. Like when patients have heart attacks, they said after you have a heart attack, you need to go to see a cardiac rehab, because this is what they teach you. All right? They, so, have, a, they have an excellent program in Springfield. For, re for COPD, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And this is the whole thing of learning how to do these. Okay. So let's go through these medicines quickly. This is called the Aspiriva, and you have all seen the Aspiriva. This is A. So this is really not a broom, it's not a key, it's kind of in the metal, it's a wedge that keeps the door open, okay? Now, the Aspiriva comes in a pill, and the pill is not for you to drink it, but the pill gets into the little container. And we take the pill, and I think Walter is using these things, right? The Aspiriva, when no. you wanted before? No, he was on it before. Oh, before, yeah. So we put the little pill there, we close that, we open that, we break the pill there, and we put our mouth and we suck it. And that's it. And that is done. See? And the pill is done. So that's one. Okay? Yeah, you had one like that. There's another one. Yeah. This is also a broom. The old devices that come in different shapes and forms. You open these, you click. This is like a peppercorn. Click, yeah. <laughs> click, put your mouth, suck. Okay? That's another one. This is another one that many of you are on. This is the discus, right? The yes. discus. Is that hand there? Hand there. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. You open all the way. This way. Open the little. Put your mouth in here and suck. And you have a little counter on the side of the inhaler, yeah. and it tells you exactly how many you have left. Okay. That's another one. This is a, the pulmonary core, and you know it's working because it does this. Okay, that's the noise you get with it. Okay, now this is a Turdosa that I think Ramona is on, yes. right? Uh, this guy is also very easy to use. Better make sure you take the cover off. Yeah. Okay, whatever you do with it. So you take your cover off, you prime, put your mouth, put it in your mouth, and suck it in. And then you get another one. Have you seen these before? Yeah, I have a, the I have a, lot, of, I have a lot of those that go bad. Though. Yeah, as I say, if you had any feedback about those because we've had probably five of them now that they don't work they Click. get stuck about 20 or 40 yeah. and, yeah, and yeah. they have been very good about or our insurance or the has been good about taking them back and sending replacements but it's if you google it it'll say that that's a common issue the clicking thing so um, what i'm kind uh, of thinking that with that <coughs> all my other ones i always shake them you don't I, have to. I haven't been but shaking those, you but don't. before I was, maybe that's what I was no, screwing it up. No, you shouldn't. No. I think what's screwing it up is that the, um, who are the makers? Uh, I don't know. A forest. Forest came out with the, what they thought was a good device, but I don't think it's cutting it. You know, so I might have to put you back on this Spiriva, because by far is the, the only one that ha we haven't heard any complaints. The only complaint we hear is that patients swallow it thinking that you got to swallow the pill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, that goes back to our our fault because we don't tell you to swallow the pill, you have to inhale the pill, right? So uh, we might have, the, no, we haven't, I actually haven't heard from anybody, but I'm not surprised because it's a sort of brand new device that yeah, has I've come out. I've never had a problem with that. No? And I've been okay. on it, what, two years? But yeah. maybe it's because he shakes it. Did, did you ever shake yours? Yeah. Maybe yeah. you shake it. Yeah. So that's, that's this is a new yes. guy that's coming out now. Every <clears throat> inhaler is going to look like this. What the FDA is trying to do is trying to standardize this nightmare. Why do we have such a nightmare? You know why COPD and asthma such a, so many so many little types is like a hundred kinds. Anybody knows? I have no idea. Right. The reason why years ago the only inhalers we have used to come like this. Yeah. They were all like this. Now, the propellant that I have, it has CFC. CFC, which is a, the propellant they put in the inhaler so it will come out, depletes the ozone layer. And according to the Montreal Agreement, that CFC needed to go. So they needed to come with a different propellant that didn't deplete the ozone layer. That's why you see now CFC-free sprays and everything, because we can't have CFC anymore because it depletes the ozone layer and the panda bears or the polar bears don't have any... Whatever. Oh, that's the standards are fine. It's the polar bears. It's yeah. the polar bears. <laughs> so anyway, but that's why. So after the FDA banned that, 
they said, okay, that's it. You guys need to come up with different ways of getting, giving the patients <coughs> patients that are not propellant based. So this is how they came up with all these wonderful ideas. But not all of them work. And, and so that, that's why the customer needs to say, tell us, you know, it's not working or it's working. But this is the new kit on the block. It's called Lipta. And this is what every inhaler is going to come as. And you probably um, are going to be switched to these two. You open here. Very easy to use. It has a little window in the side. You put your mouth in here. And you breathe in. As you breathe in, you activate the little capsule. And it gets released into your lungs. You have to rinse your mouth after you use it, and you cover it and you're done. And it's 30 days, so after 30 days you throw it away. But you know how many you have because it's right into the, into the device. Okay? So that's the new kit in the block that's coming. I bet you that will cost an arm in a way. Well, and that's the thing. They come out with these Cadillac inhalers, and they have to some sort, some sort of standardize the price too, 